the only two things that cause challenging behaviour in children. Hi, this is Holly Morris from the Mindfulness Teacher YouTube channel and welcome to my podcast, Calm Kids. This is my first ever episode, so thank you so much for joining me. So just before we dive into today's topic, let me just tell you what behaviour is. So let's cover the absolute basics so that you can understand what's going on inside your children or your students. So behaviour is communication. Behaviour is communication. Okay, so it's the way that we, well, a way that we talk to others. Not verbally talk, but um, symbolically talk. It's a way that we express what we want or what we need. And we'll be coming back to wants and needs a lot in this episode. Inside our bodies, we receive a signal, okay, um, to indicate what we want or need. So these signals can come in three forms from our bodies. So it could be a sensation, an emotion, or a thought. So by sensation, I mean something like an ache, a pain, a tightness, a tingling, something that you feel in your body. And if I use the word feeling, this is what I mean by that, a sensation, Lots of people get those the terms feeling and emotion um, mixed up. They, get, they use them interchangeably, but actually a feeling is a sensation when you physically feel something. Um, and an emotion is when our body's telling us something to pay attention to. And we'll get on to that in a second. Um, emotions, to make it even more confusing, emotions can create sensations in the body too. So, for example, like if you are angry, the emotion is anger, um, but also that will cause a sensation in your body such as a quicker heart rate, flushed, warm cheeks, okay? So, a sensation, that's our body telling us that something's not well in a certain area. So, something might need stretching, rubbing, caring in some sort. So, if there's a pain, an ache, say in your shoulder, it needs maybe stretching, it needs some sort of care. That's one way that your body gives you a signal that you you need something or you want something. An emotion, okay, is our body's way of telling us to pay attention to what's going on in your life right now. Something important is happening in your life and your emotion is telling you, take notice of this. So emotions such as happiness, sadness, anger, um, okay. So if you were feeling angry, let's say the emotion is anger, Your body is telling you to pay attention to what's going on right now because whatever's happening isn't fair. That's what anger's telling you. Something that's happening now isn't fair. You need to identify what it is and sort it out. So think back to when we were cavemen and women. Um, And if you're feeling angry, that something wasn't fair in your life. So it's probably something like someone's taking the berries that that, that you collected that morning on your scavenger hunt. Um that's not fair. And if you don't get them back, it could impact your family's chance of survival. Okay. Um, All emotions are primal bodily responses. And the six core emotions um, that are primal instincts are happiness, sadness, anger, fear, surprise, and disgust. They're the six core emotions. And they're there to... Keep us, um, keep us alive, basically. Um, our body, most of our bodily sensations are there to keep us alive. Um, so nowadays, if you're feeling anger, it's more likely that it's because someone's jumped in front of you in the queue or someone's been rude to you. So it doesn't necessarily now link to your chance of survival, but that's what it, where it originated from. Okay, so anger is an emotion telling you to that something's not fair, pay attention to it right now, and you need to learn from that. You need to then do something to make it fair. So let's say another emotion, say happiness. So if you're feeling happy, it's your body's way of telling you to notice what's going on right now because whatever it is, it's making you feel good and safe and we want you to do more of that. So notice what it is that's making you happy and your body wants you to do more of that because if it's making you feel happy and safe, it means you're going to survive. Um... Again, linking back to that survival instinct. Um, 
So emotions are our body's way of telling us to do more of what keeps us safe and comfortable and less of what makes us feel uncomfortable, meaning that it could be putting us in harm or danger. That's why our body doesn't want us to experience that, to keep us safe. So this innate drive for experiences that make us feel good um, can ultimately lead us to addictions. But as we know, too much of a good thing can have a negative effect on the body. But anyway, so the final signal that our body could give us is a thought, which is an idea or an opinion coming from your mind. So to summarise that little bit, we receive a signal from the body in the form of a sensation, an emotion or a thought to inform us what our body wants or needs. And these wants and needs drive our behaviours. They cause us to act. They're our motivators to get what we want all day, every day, okay? They're always going on within our bodies, telling us what we want and need, leading us into action. For example, a sensation you could have is a dry mouth, okay? That's something you can feel, physically feel. That's your body's way of telling you that you need something. You need a drink of water. And then that motivates our behaviour, that causes us to act, to get up, go to the kitchen, get a glass, fill it with water and drink it. Okay, to meet that need. An emotion we could have, say, boredom. It's not one of the core emotions, it's still an emotion. There is a bit of debate about that, but anyway, I digress. So if we're feeling bored, that's our body's way of telling us we have a want. You might want to read a book. And that want, again, motivates you to act, motivates, it drives our behaviour to get up, find the book that we want and sit and read it. A thought, you might have a thought such as, um, I wonder how much a new phone would cost. So that's a thought coming from your mind. And then that's telling you your want. You want to find it out. Then that motivates our behaviour, causes us to act, causes you to look online and find out how much a new phone would cost. So these behaviours show others what our underlying wants and needs are without us having to say anything. So by seeing me drink a glass of water, you can translate that behaviour into knowing that, oh, Holly, she must have been thirsty. Or if, I, if you saw me sat reading a book, you could, um, you'd know that, oh, she must have been bored, she had some spare time, she likes to read romantic fiction, <laughs> whatever. Um, or by seeing me on my phone, like looking on the internet, well... You probably couldn't see the screen, but you probably you probably just think I was rude. But anyway, you get the gist. You'd be able to see from my behaviour probably what my want or need was behind that. Just like you can tell someone's mood from their facial expressions, okay? It's the body's way of informing others of your wants and needs. So we all have these signals in our, from our bodies, the sensations, emotions or thoughts. So no matter what age we are, even babies... They have wants and needs as well, okay? So these wants and needs are so instinctual. So just as a baby, they'll have a want for warmth and comfort. They'll cry if their caregiver puts them down. They just want to be held and feel safe. Again, it just linking to that survival mode. So the only two things that cause challenging behaviour in children are their unmet wants and their unmet needs. They're the only two things that will be causing your child or your students challenging behaviour. So now that you've got a basic understanding of what behaviour is, remember behaviour is communication, um, let's like now apply that to our children or our students. So as adults when we have a want or a need we can usually meet that ourselves. The somewhat irrational behaviours that we sometimes see in children often um, are often brought on by that want and need being unmet. Okay, the children sometimes can't physically meet that themselves and it leads them to feeling frustrated and that causes this challenging behaviour. If that want or need is met, then that behaviour will stop instantly it'll stop straight away because there won't be a need for that behavior anymore so 
if the child couldn't physically meet their want or need by themselves, the easy answer would be to ask someone to meet it for them. Simple. But there are issues. So one, they might not be able to verbalise what they want. Two, they might not actually know what they want or need. Or three, they don't want to verbalise what they want. And these are what causes them frustrations inside and causes that challenge in behaviour. So let's just go back to those three points. So one, if they can't verbalise what they want, so I mean by that they can't physically put it into words, they might not have learnt the language yet, they might be too young, or they might have speech and communication difficulties. Um, Two, if they don't actually know what they want or need. So an example of that might be a toddler if they they might see their their mum hugging another child or their sibling and they might feel inside that pang of jealousy but they don't actually know why they're feeling that jealousy they don't know that oh they want that attention and they want the love and the hugs so they'll be aware of that physical feeling inside that sensation of the jealousy like that sinking feeling in their stomach um that ache you kind of like get a bit of that ache in your heart don't you if you're jealous maybe like the tears welling up inside their eyes they get that signal from the body those sensations but they might not be able to mentally process that all um, into what they want or need or number three they might not want to say what they want or need um for example if a child like whenever they cry if they've been told don't cry only babies cry then they're not going to want to express it when they're feeling sad. They're not want, going to want to cry and say what they want or need. Um, so now let's talk through some examples of how your children or your students may behave and how this always stems back to them having an unmet want or an unmet need. So let's start with a toddler. So the signal that their body's giving them, um, let's say it's a sensation of hunger in their stomach. And that's telling their body that they, they have a need. They have a need for food. But because they can't physically go and get the food from the kitchen themselves, this is where the issues arise. If they could say, Mom, Dad, I'm hungry, then problem solved, need met, and then the behaviours don't even start. But if they can't do that, like with most toddlers, this will drive their behaviour. So they'll maybe crawl to the kitchen and reach up at the cupboards or they might start to shout or whinge or chew at the objects that are around them if they can't move. Um, So if we see someone's behaviour, we're usually able to tell, we're usually able to translate what they want or need from that behaviour. And in this case, if the caregiver can work out that from those actions, the toddler's hungry then they can get them the food that they need, the needs met, the hunger is satiated, and then that behaviour will stop, that whinging will stop, or the reaching up to the cupboards, that will stop. But the issues come when the caregiver can't read that behaviour. So remember, behaviour is communication, and the caregiver needs to act like a translator, translating that behaviour into language. And if they can't translate that, then the child will get frustrated, they get annoyed. After some time, the hunger pangs will get stronger, that need will become stronger, the hunger would be stronger, and then that resulting behaviour will become stronger. So instead of whinging now, they might be screaming, crying, kicking. And it's this is why we have phrases such as toddler tantrums and the terrible twos. Because these toddlers are at the very start of their journey in learning to talk, in learning to communicate. And so that frustration of not being understood happens so regularly. So when this happens and the child's behaviours are becoming more challenging, this can lead to the adult becoming frustrated. Frustrated that they can't understand why their child or the student is acting like that. And that can trigger strong emotions in the adult and that will affect their mood and then therefore their behaviour too. So this this point, this is the pivotal moment for the adult. It can now go one way or the other. So, root A. 
the adult can do some deep breaths to stay calm and logical. They could share their calm with that child and help them to calm down by soothing them with a hug or they could crouch down to their level, um, reassuring them that everything's all right in a calm tone of voice. And then they could they could literally ask that child to, to point out what they want or what they need. Um, if that doesn't work, they could ask them yes, no questions to decipher what they want. So, do you want the toilet? And then hopefully the toddler can say yes or no, or nod or shake the head. Do you want some food? Do you want to go outside? So asking them those simple yes, no questions until they find out what that need or want is, and then they can meet it. And then that will stop that behaviour. Or route B, if they don't act as the investigator to find out what the need is, maybe because they're in a rush, they don't have the time or the patience for that in that on that day, um, then the child's need still isn't met. So in this case that we're talking about, in this example with the toddler, they'd still be hungry. And that sensation of hunger is only going to get stronger for that child. Their behaviour is only going to get bigger, bolder, stronger to express that stronger need. Um, and it's going to continue until that need is met, until they've eaten. So remember, it's a, it's a survival instinct. And to survive, we must eat. So it's not going to go away. So as an adult, if you don't have that time or that patience, so we might just say, stop, stop whining, stop crying. Um, for a few minutes, the child might stop if they have that ability to control themselves, which is quite a high order skill, so lots of toddlers don't. Um, but even if they do manage to stop that whinging and crying, it'll only be for a short while until that hunger gets worse. And... When they start again, that adult will probably just get angry at them. Angry for not following your instructions, not listening to you. And that adult's mood will get worse then. They might start shouting at the child or trying to discipline them for not doing as they said. So saying things like, if you don't stop crying, there won't be any sweets tonight. Or you won't be going to your friend's house or getting any presents from Santa. Um fill in the blanks, as you might usually say. Um, and then it's just a never-ending battle of the wills until someone gives in, or usually until it's then dinner time and then the need just gets met, coincidentally. Um, and then it might end in the adult giving them a little lesson. Look, I told you so. If you just act as I said you should, if you just stop crying when you said, look, everything's better, isn't it? You're happy. And then it happens again probably the next time and the next time. Um, yeah, and then the needs are met coincidentally, but the lesson isn't learnt. And you had all that pain and heartache and emotional distress um, for an extended period of time that just drains both of you. Um, instead of just asking, finding out what that underlying need was to meet it a lot earlier on. So... An example like that, that can happen with happen with older children too, who can verbalise their needs, but they might not know that that growl in their stomach means hunger, or it might have been a subtle hunger, or a drop in their blood sugars or something, which is harder to identify as hunger. So they might that's maybe why they struggled to verbalise that they were hungry. Um, that happens to my son, he's three years old, and he just gets pure hangry at like four o'clock. But that's me knowing that and expecting him to get hungry then and providing him with a snack to stop those behaviours before they start. Now, let's look at another example. So for a child who can communicate, who can talk, but might not be able to identify what their want or their need is. So picture this. You're about to go out the house and you so you hold your child's coat up and tell them to put it on as you're kind of ushering their arms into it okay now inside that child they might get a signal from their body as an emotion they might feel anger okay so that's their body telling them that something's not fair and their want underneath that is to not have their coat on they don't want to have their coat on then the behavior that you might see is that they shout no and just throw the coat on the floor Okay, 
So from that behaviour, you get the gist that they don't want their coat on. And if it's an option, if the, if it's a nice warm day and they don't really need to have it on, then we could just say to them, okay, well, next time, just say no politely. Then they could rephrase that. They could say it politely. Mom, dad, please, I don't want to wear my coat today. Is that all right? Yeah. And then their, their want is met. And then those unwanted behaviours, that shouting, throwing the coat on the floor, that's stopped. Because there's no need for it now. Their want is met. Or in hindsight, actually, we could have initially asked them if they wanted to wear their coat or not, instead of just saying, put it on, put it on. Anyway, but if it's not an option, whether to wear the coat or not, then that's where we need to be investigators. And we need to think, right, why don't they want to wear it? Because when we know that core want or need, we know we can meet it and solve that problem, stop the behaviours. The simplest way to do that is to, number one, stay calm. As the adult, you need to share your calm with your child or your student. They might need soothing by you using a relaxed, calm tone of voice, a relaxed posture, maybe come down to their eye level. If they're already feeling frustrated, they might even need a hug. And then keeping that calm, number two, simply communicate with them. Keep it so super simple. So just ask them, why don't you want to wear it? If they're not sure, if they can't tell you, they say, I just don't. Give them some options. Those yes, no questions. Is it because you're already warm? Do you not like this coat? Would you prefer a different coat on? Is it because you want your Batman t-shirt on show? And then they can answer yes or no. And then when you know the answer, you can sort out an... Um, a mutual agreement. So remember that when they feel anger, it's when something doesn't feel fair to them. So if you know the reason for that anger, you can logically explain it to them to seem fair. And then reduce, you're re- reducing that anger then, reducing that emotion, reducing that want or that need and reducing those unwanted behaviours. So for example, if they say, yes, I'm already warm, so you can explain then, well, it's sunny outside, yeah, but there's, it's windy as well. So you'll, you'll feel cold when we go outside. And then in their brain, they'll be like, okay, that, that seems fair. I'll probably come around to your way of thinking, yeah, I'll put my coat on. If it was because they didn't like the coat, you can say, well, that's fine. Let's choose another coat to wear. Again, to them, that feels fair. Or if they wanted the Batman t-shirt on show, <laughs> you could just say, right, well, you need to wear your coat to X, Y, Z, wherever we're going. And then you get to take your coat off when we're at that destination. And then they should hopefully feel, right, that's fair. Those behaviours are reduced. You get what you want. You wanted them to put that coat on. And hopefully then by them not feeling that anger, them feeling seen, heard and understood, then they feel like, okay, that's fine. Yes, I'll put my coat on. I'm still, it's still fair. This exact scenario happened with my son, okay? And he couldn't say why. And then it turns out, after chatting later on, um, later on that day when he was calm, was that the zip on that coat scratched underneath his chin when he wore it, which is why he didn't want to wear it. But he couldn't tell me that in that moment when he was feeling frustrated. Because when children get like that, or adults, anyone, when you have a strong emotion like that, it cuts off (laughs) that logical side of that brain. Sometimes you can't verbalise that want or need. So that's why, that's step number one, keeping your calm and sharing it with your child, ensuring that they feel calm. They don't feel rushed and frustrated and annoyed. That's when you engage that logical side of that brain and they can hopefully explain it then. <clears throat> if you don't become the investigator and find out that want or need and you're just urging them to put it on, come on, no, no, put the coat on, we need to go, come on, don't be silly, get in the car, we need it on now then that those frustration feelings and that anger just builds so quickly and they can't be logical. They get angrier, you become angrier. And these emotions and the behaviours just get bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger. And before you know it, you're telling them that Christmas is cancelled <laughs> all because they didn't want to put the coat on. Um, so when you're in a rush to leave the house as we all are, 
it at that moment in time, it might seem like too time consuming to just stop and ask them those questions. For what can seem like the smallest point in the world to you, the most insignificant thing. But to them, it's not. It's a big thing. They need to feel seen and heard and understood. The alternative, if you're not asking those questions and listening to your child and trying to understand them, is that that child is learning that subconsciously their opinion doesn't matter. They're subconsciously learning that you don't care what they think. You don't care about their opinion. And when this little message is repeated to them, obviously not verbally, but in your actions, when it's repeated day in, day out, on these tiny little matters, as like whether they want the coat on or not, then... The children will soon stop telling you their wants and their needs. They'll soon stop communicating with you. And you don't want that when they, when they grow older, say that in their teenagers, and they need someone to turn to when their issues are a lot more significant than wearing the coat or not. And it's embedding these behaviours and these habits and this communication style when they're younger. So to summarise my first podcast, can't believe I'm saying that, we've learned that behaviour is a form of communication. To put a stop to this challenging behaviour, you need to simply meet your child or your student's wants or needs. When a child displays challenging behaviour, you need to put your Sherlock Holmes flat cap on and ask yourself, what do they want or what do they need? And then when you're able to meet that, you stop the need for any challenging behaviour and your child or your student will feel seen, heard and understood. So I appreciate you spending time with me today. Thank you so much. Speak soon.